Welcome and good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world, and welcome back to AI and Intelligent Automation Live. Um, my name is Sally Fletcher and I'm the Head of Online Events for IQPC. Um, I'm delighted to be bringing you this event in conjunction with the AIIA Network, um, our portal which provides great information for the Artificial Intelligence Shared Service, um, Intelligent Automation and RPA space. Um, I'm here to introduce our next speaker. Um, we're really honored to have him here today. His name is Morty Elji. He's the Senior Vice President for GBS, Global Business Services for Olam International, um, coming to us from Chennai. Um, a little bit about Morty. Um, as I said, he leads the Global Business Services for Olam International, um, which is a leading agribusiness operating from seed to shelf. Um, the Global Business Services is a multifunction shared services compromising of finance, HR, risk management, supply chain, um, and big data analytics, with, which we've just been discussing. Um, they also include supply chain um, as well. I just missed that one out, sorry. <laughs> lots, lots and lots of things within the GBS. Um, Morty is a key leader of Olam's digital task force, and he champions the application of new technologies such as RPA, paperless and smart contracts, including blockchain, um, big data analytics, and digital traceability solutions within Olam. Today, he's going to be talking to us about building a 100% in-house team versus outsourcing, um, a question which I know a lot of people have been asking themselves um, and is really kind of shaking up operating models within this space. Um, we're going to be looking at Olam's adoption path and plan to grow RPA. Specifically, understanding what are the key benefits of internal RPA capability. Um, what are the limitations of the fully in-house team? Scalability, sustainability, stability, and long-term savings. And finally, lessons learned from developing and managing an in-house team. Um, as usual, please write your questions into Morty um, in the Q&A box um, or in the chat, and we'll endeavor to get those answered directly after this presentation. So I'm going to hand over um, for, to Morty to lead us in this session. Over to you. Uh, thanks, Ali, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Wollam is a leading agribusiness player operating from seed to shelf uh, in over 70 countries. Uh, we deal in products such as coffee, cocoa, that you are very familiar with, uh, and we have 16 BU platforms, and uh, our operations almost spans in every continent. Uh, Olam GBS uh, supports uh, Olam operation, and uh, we have business process vertical, apart from the advanced analytics. Uh, we have uh, support uh, that's spanning about 30 countries. As you see, we support in developed countries as well as developing countries in Asia and Africa. Our operation is 24 by 5, which comes with its own challenges. And we deal in all the technologies uh, that helps the operation, operation to be efficient. Currently, we are 650 plus strong team and all of them are graduates. And um, like every other GBS captive, we want to uh, be a best in class. And uh, most importantly, that we want to uh, aid OLAM's growth path, as well as transform the process and make the company very agile. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, how uh, we have gone about in the RPA journey and uh, uh, how did we see RPA uh, in the beginning, you know, about uh, 18 months ago and what has been uh, our experience and how do we see that uh, RPA unfolding in our operation. So over the next 20 minutes, uh, I will share my experience and thereafter I will take up your question as Sally mentioned. So what's RPA? I think when I first heard this term uh, two years ago, I thought, you know, it could, it, is it an old wine in a new bottle? Uh, automation uh, is not something new. It has been there for a long time. And we used to automate everything in an ERP. And uh, that then came the uh, Microsoft Excel-based automation using the Visual Basic for application, VBA-based automation. So therefore, Automation is not uh, something that it has, uh, you know, taken shape in the last few years. The benefits which we have realized in our traditional automation has been to reduce cost, 
to do it in a shorter time frame and to improve the accuracy by building a check and balance uh, as more and more it gets systemized and automated you are able to also draw accuracy and it also provided control uh, which uh, the system we can rely on rather than just relying on a human check. We also had in our traditional system various sorts of solution that we offered. It could be a workflow bot or a capturing bot which is really screen scrapping from the system or comparing two different files or splitting one information into multiple parts uh, or consolidating information from multiple parts into one, creating an automated PPT. These are all the solutions that we came up with in the visual basic for application based automation, very traditional in nature, all undertaken in house. We also realized this automation involves multiple application, right? It could be in the form of uh, MS Office, or we might also need to pull the data from ERP or feed into the, an ERP system. Many a times uh, we have to use mails uh, for communication. Uh, and if there are workflows, which is true in our case, we have to also involve the workflow system and the data could be a structured and unstructured data. So the, the, the traditional solution works if the number of applications are small and the applications are more digitized form. And, uh, and we said therefore have been having an experience in you automating the reports, automating the incentive communications that the HR team needs. So there were lots of benefits that we have seen and we had more than 300 applications or programs that we have built to support our operations. The traditional automation were quick in delivery. It's a very point solution and it's an outcome focused and uh, the person who comes up with the problem, he gets the result. Easy to understand by all participants. You don't need a big change management or you don't need a program management around it. It doesn't require a huge investment. Uh, all you need is an MS office and uh, it's managed by business. Uh, when I say managed, it is really owned by business, uh, it, not by the technology team. But of course, uh, it has its own limitations. You know, it's, it's one uh, time, it's therefore not reusable uh, by every other participant since it is a point solution. Uh, we are not drawing industry expertise. So since everything is in in-house, um, uh, whatever solution that you come up with is limited by uh, the knowledge that your team has. Uh, and therefore it does not draw from the cross industry expertise. And, and certainly it requires a coding knowledge and uh, therefore you need uh, people with the VBA skills. Uh, can't do an end-to-end -end work. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous uh, slide that it requires a lot of uh, application uh, for uh, conducting or performing one activity when the application is more than two, then the VBA based uh, uh, automations uh, are, are not uh, totally efficient. Uh, the benefits are not going to be huge uh, since you are uh, looking at the solution case by case and uh, successful as I mentioned is mainly in the structured data and an unstructured data uh, it, uh, it, it probably can't really uh, meet the needs. So therefore uh, we you know therefore we need to really have a fresh look at if the traditional automation requires a change and that's really why one should look at the RPA. So that's uh, how we moved into an RPA. If I were to bit summarize, it's a point solution. There is a lack of VBA talent in the market and they were disappearing as well. Uh, so you are unable to meet the growing needs of automation, not reusable. And I want to highlight that there is also a governance problem. The more you try to do within the VBA script, you need to provide the username password and uh, that actually opens up a lot of security risk. And, uh, and, and also that the traditional automation uh, can't really generate a productivity beyond 20%. That at least has been our case. So we looked at therefore RPA uh, with this uh, perspective and experience. 
We see RPA uh, as a combination of a process and technology, right? It, it's not completely a technology, neither uh, it can work uh, only purely relying on process. And should we be doing all of this in-house or should we be outsourcing uh, would vary uh, when we are going to have this uh, uh, dual way of looking at this RPA. So let's see the process. Uh, you can't really uh, dive into this RPA journey or begin your RPA journey uh, without uh, re-engineering the process. When If you do, uh, like everyone says, that you are going to make the process, uh, I would say more inefficient, but you are going to really uh, turn the inefficient process in an efficient way, right? So that is not how you should begin. So you should actually spend a lot of time in looking at the process uh, and redesign that, re-engineer it, uh, and before automating it with any technology. The other aspect is about the technology. How do you really select which tool uh, is going to be the one that suits your need and your company in your environment? Therefore, I have seen we need to make four decisions. Right, the first one is on process. Right, which process that you need to automate and how do you go about redesigning? Should you be therefore doing this entire thing in-house or should you be engaging a consulting organization? That's the first decision. The second decision is about uh, which tool you need to select. Third decision is about how do you go about implementing? Should you be implementing in-house? Should you be engaging a vendor? Or should you have a blended approach? The fourth decision is about, okay, now you have implemented the RPA how do you go about managing it? So while the process doesn't change frequently, but they do change, right? What happens when you change or tweak the process? How do you go about configuring it and implementing it uh, without uh, the business uh, uh, is impacted by the delay? So therefore, you, still, you need to have that clarity on uh, how do you go about uh, managing the automation post implementation. So over the next uh, uh, 10 minutes, I'm going to really share how we have gone about these four decisions. So let's look at uh, where should we be actually uh, implementing the RPA. For that, we need to uh, have our uh, understanding from the process uh, dimension as well as from the uh, uh, how it impacts the business or the benefit dimension. So there are going to be process which are easier to do and uh, having a high impact. There are going to be process which are difficult to do. Uh, uh, it might have an high impact or it could have a very low impact. And that's what I have presented here. This is more very directional, uh, uh, true to the environment that I operate. Uh, the master data management is extremely rule-based process and uh, therefore uh, it's easier to configure this process in an automation. It also therefore generate uh, uh, tangible benefit uh, by release of people, have a better control as well as have a better accuracy and therefore the benefits are really high. And uh, however, that is not so true when it comes to generating an income statement. So income statement has a lot of, uh, is rule based, but it also has complex rule and in some cases some judgment. And, uh, and it's also difficult to release people in that particular process. So therefore the business impact is low. Uh, the, uh, the complexity of the process is uh, uh, high, hence uh, I would consider that it is less amenable to do. So we need to have this perspective. We also need to know that uh, where to use RPA and where to use the chatbot and where we need to involve machine learning. So that really depends on what sorts of inputs that we get, uh, whether it is in structured data or unstructured data, what sort of systems that we use and uh, what sort of skills that are required and how much that processes is a rule based or not a rule based. And of course, last but not least, we need to have an idea on size of the pie uh, and size of the price. So how much of um, effort that goes into these process. 
So where chatbot is going to be useful uh, may not be, uh, the RPA may not be the right candidate. So in our experience, therefore, we came up with a tool. We, uh, and uh, uh, and we, that's how we actually prioritize if any of the process that we want to automate or not. And we have uh, four quadrants, uh, which is the prime quadrant is basically where the processes is high and the business impact is also high. Uh, and that's the one, of course, it's a low hanging fruit to take. The next one could be the gold or a good process. The gold process are the ones which is uh, where the process is probably is low, but the business impact is high. And the uh, other good to do process is the process is very high. However, the business impact is low, right? And, and we are very careful not to really attempt a not amenable process uh, is, uh, you know, consciously. And that's how this tool helps. And we have, therefore, this five dimensions on the transaction volume, payback, and workload balancing. Each one have a very different views. The workload balancing helps the accounting team to uh, provide the, uh, you know, uh, the reporting within the shorter time or uh, within the available month close period. Uh, at the same time, it also makes the employee to relax during the time because the bot is performing some of the activities otherwise they have been doing. Uh, so we may not have any FTE release. We could have a high FTE release, but we might have a low payback because uh, the cost of doing it might be high. So therefore we have given a different weightage for a payback and FTE release. And uh, this is how we actually categorize the business impact. We are also uh, prioritizing uh, for a better uh, accuracy. So uh, as you see the process prone to errors, right where, where we are missing the accuracy targets, we try to really prioritize. And uh, so that's also important and a benefit of an RPA, not necessarily always FT release is the be all and end all. The other end about the process ease is all about how frequent the process uh, is performed, whether it is a rule based or a judgment that for me, every process is rule based, but to what extent uh, the rule is complex or easy to configure and uh, how mature is the process, right? The process will have to be stable and for it to get automated, uh, is it recently uh, designed or a changed process in which case we have to give some time before we automate. And uh, the process complexity uh, would define to what extent you can uh, configure the automation end to end. Uh, that's, uh, so when you automate a process, not necessarily it is an end to end. So it might vary between a 50% to a 90, 95%. You need to still give an exceptions to every process. So process complexity dimension defines it. Uh, the, the input data, the quality of it and the type of it also depends to what extent you can actually uh, be successful in your RPA initiative. And the last but not least is if the process is uh, uh, very sensitive to business, whether it is customer facing or uh, external facing and uh, the, the, uh, the impact of any error can cause a high financial damage. Uh, I think that is something that you should be very careful, at least in the beginning of your RPA journey. And, and we are quite cognizant of that. So that really uh, defines uh, our process ease. Uh, as I mentioned before, so we pick up the prime first, depending on our capacity, then we go for either the gold process or good to do process. So that's on the process tool. Uh, now we move to the second decision on tool selection. I think there are, there isn't one tool that's going to suit in every need of us. And uh, it would vary uh, depending on uh, the various uh, automation requests that you would get. Some tool would work well, when it comes to application involving MS Office, some tool would work uh, in a Citrix environment. Some tool are having a very good extraction engine, therefore it would work well on unstructured data use cases. Uh, some tools are very good to configure it. Uh, some are difficult to configure, but works pretty well. 
and uh, uh, and, and therefore licensing also pretty much varies in terms of how much you need to uh, invest on uh, upfront and uh, and some of the licensing uh, would also the commercials would play some part of role in it so in our case uh, we have gone uh, for a dual vendor strategy we would have uh, seen at least six different solutions and narrowed down to two uh, uh, we also considered to what extent we would get uh, support when it is required uh, when i say support is how uh, uh, agile or responsive they are in clarifying meeting our request in managing our system uh, having it, it's not necessarily all about tool and technology right finally you need people to operate this so you need to consider your environment uh, if you are chosen to have uh, uh, enough uh, you know number of people out there who can uh, play with it and configure it and manage it if the ecosystem is not fully evolved whatsoever tool that you have chosen you might uh, find that you don't have, you can't find people or you can't train people to really manage it so we have uh, given due consideration to this talent part as well uh, when we made the tool selection uh, so in in summary you need to look at the various uh, technical specification and compare it with your needs thereafter you need to look at the commercials uh, and and thirdly you need to also look at the uh, the ecosystem that you operate in and uh, and what sorts of implementation partner that you can get and what kind of a talent that you can get if you choose to operate in us okay and uh, i would also talk about the third uh, uh, decision that we made that is regarding the implementation so we went for uh, uh, a consulting company to implement both for process design as well as for uh, configuring the tool for an rpa uh, that would be true for uh, our initial set of an rpa that we went for live and at the same time we also uh, hired uh, a team and we built a team who would there thereafter take this journey forward and this team work closely with the consultant and have understood as to how to design uh, or redesign the process with a view of uh, uh, the rpa and also how to configure it and then implement it so uh, we use this uh, implementation as a training ground for our newly built team uh, so therefore our uh, point of view and our uh, strategy is to do uh, the implementation in house for the process that we consider simple and we have done it a few of the process in house and wherever we think the process are complex uh, then we go for a blended strategy uh, of involving the external consulting firm uh, as well as uh, using our own team to implement when it comes to the fourth decision on post implementation uh, i believe that we need to have an in house team to support both uh, scheduling uh, of uh, managing the bots as well as uh, attending to some of the change requests that comes to attend to some of the minor uh, process changes that can happen now and then uh, so therefore that has to be a completely an in house kind of a team that has to manage so these are all the this is how we went about that fourth decision uh, in the rpa journey i'm sure most of you know what is bot uh, uh, and uh, having known uh, the definition in this form and fashion and year before we still uh, you know are understanding the difference between a bot and the bot license and uh, the usage of it right so but in 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 a nutshell it is a 24 by 7 uh, not necessarily you can use it 24 by 7 but it is still available and and it's sequential right you can't really do four different programs at any one point in time so unlike that you can actually open multiple different excel files and you can still operate in in different excel files like human you can actually look at just one file and operate it the computer can only do one file and operate so therefore it is sequential but it is multi talented 
right? Uh, can do finance or a payroll and uh, a supply chain all in one machine. Very rule-based and uh, the cognitive is still evolving in my view. So I'll show you one bot that we have developed. So this particular bot that we developed uh, is for a process, uh, which is a direct cost provisioning, which used to take uh, between four hours to six hours. Uh, we have cut down to uh, less than 15 minutes. So although this video is for 30 seconds, this has taken actually uh, about between 10 to 15 minutes. So this is a huge win as you, as I have mentioned in the beginning that uh, not necessarily FT release should be uh, a, a uh, uh, but this particular bot has helped in uh, a better workload balancing during the month close process uh, between uh, you know, reducing from a four hours to less than 15 minutes. Right, and uh, is RPA magic bullet, right? I, I, I must say that, you know, over the last six months that uh, we have built uh, about 15 plus uh, uh, bots, right uh, for an end-to-end -end process and over uh, 50 reports. I, I strongly believe that RPA is not a magic bullet to save cost and, uh, and reduce the number of people we have in chat services or a larger organization. Uh, we have to first eliminate the process we do if it doesn't add any value. We have to simplify it as much as possible and make it lean. And uh, we have to standardize it uh, as much as possible. Only then actually you can actually use the RPA. And uh, one, only then you have to attempt the automation. And uh, that's have been our experience. So RPA, while it is not a magic bullet, uh, RPA will push you doing the first three, the elimination, simplification, and standardization. So the anticlimax of the video which I just showed, helped us to understand how do we uh, do all these three and re-engineer the process. Uh, we spent about 15 days and uh, what we were able to do is we actually optimize the ERP system. So whatever we saw in Excel out there uh, performed by an RPA, uh, we reconfigured in ERP in a very smart way and we even eliminated an RPA itself. Having said that, I'm not saying that RPA is not going to be useful, uh, but you need to first optimize your ERP and not uh, try to use RPA all the places. The second area that you need to do is for reporting, once again, RPA is not going to be the best solution. You need to first see that what are the reporting tools that you have. It could be a BI solution that you might have, or a SAP business objects, or a Tableau, or a ClickView. So you need to use your uh, reporting solution pretty well before you attempt the RPA. It is also possible that you know you needed an RPA because you are pushing a data from one system to another system, and you should first of all go for an uh, a, a EDA, which is an interface-based programs. Uh, rather than going into an RPA. Once you explore all of this, thereafter, in my view, you should go for an RPA, and that's the approach that we are taking. And as I mentioned, uh, RPA, once again, helps us to reevaluate and revisit these uh, principles. So in our first uh, implementation, uh, we realized uh, it's going to be a set of uh, team coming together uh, from business, operational excellence, uh, internal RPA team and an RPA vendor. So they actually work together uh, like an you know agile team. They have to do the sprints. Uh, the sprints can be in the form of uh, a small part of the process and then get this right. And uh, finally, 
uh, rolling this out uh, one by one on the production environment. So this team will have to really work together and unlike uh, uh, a traditional approach where the business makes the request to the IT team and IT team does an automation, here I think they will have to all work together to make the bot come to life. Having said that, the business should own this bot. Any results emanating out of it, uh, especially when it goes wrong, uh, completely uh, the responsibility lies with the business and you should make this very clear and upfront uh, to the business team. Uh, the process selection, as I mentioned, is very important. Uh, so we were very clear right at the beginning and chose the process that we can manage it better. On the rollout, you know, all of you might be very familiar with the transition framework, cutover, go live and steady state. I think you should follow the same framework. Um, and in the cutover phase, the bot is operating, but you are, you are, you are, uh, human team is still watching if the bot is working fine or not. And uh, it, uh, like the regular transition, you are not going to hit all your uh, KPIs right at the beginning. Similarly, the, the bots uh, will do a happy path. Happy path is that bot is able to completely perform the way humans would perform. And that would uh, slowly scale up from a sub 50% to uh, 80 plus or a 90 plus uh, happy path, you know, over a period of a month. So you need to follow a cutover. Thereafter, once you declare a go live, you need to watch if all the KPIs are continued to be performed over a uh, you know, few months before you declare a steady state. So finally, uh, my point of view uh, on RPA is that it's a temporary fix. Uh, and uh, having said that, we can use RPA more than our traditional automation system because it brings governance, because, and it can work with any number of system. It can give you productivity higher than 20%, uh, and uh, it can work very well with the uh, different types of info inputs. Uh, so therefore, and, and it is pretty versatile in nature, and uh, you can let it operate on its own rather than supervised by any human. So for these advantages, you should certainly switch from uh, a traditional automation to the, uh, the robotic automation where the tools are designed uh, by the industry and you therefore draw the industry expertise. Uh, the benefits definitely is going to be a function of scale, process complexity and maturity, and most importantly, uh, the ingenuity of the process design, right? And that's really the place where uh, you know, um, uh, most how well you are, uh, con you know, how, how well you are going to uh, construct the process like, and uh, the the OE team, the business team, and RPA team coming together and design the process smartly. Uh, the same process working in an RP RPA, uh, well designed and not well designed can have a very different result. Uh, so therefore you could have a benefit of 3x or a 20% depends on these factors. For me, uh, uh, considering the process is bound to change and uh, because of the dynamic situation uh, of this world uh, uh, faces, uh, we should have a payback of less than 12 months. Uh, if any process, the payback is more than 12 months, I think we should be very careful in selecting it for uh, automation unless uh, it, it uh, uh, provides other benefits like workload balancing or a, a higher accuracy. So this is really uh, our point of view. I think uh, I'm, I'm uh, although I was a skeptic uh, 18 months before, uh, I would think uh, it is time that everyone should get on to this journey. Uh, we discussed only RPA. I think you know that is also true for chatbot. And this journey is, has just begun and uh, we are going to evolve and industry is also going to evolve and, uh, and it's better to uh, catch the train now rather than miss the bus. Uh, thank you everyone for hearing me out till now and I'm very happy to hear your questions and your perspectives on RPA uh, and over to you Sally. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much for such an informative uh, presentation. It was really interesting to see the video of exactly how that robot was working. Um, testament to how good the presentation was. We already have questions flooding in. Um, so I'm going to um, start with a couple of those. Um, and just a reminder to the audience to write your questions into the Q&A box um, on your screen and we'll get uh, multi to answer as many as possible. Okay, so first things first. Um, uh, Shrija asks, um, is there any process mining methodology or software you recommend or use? Uh, I think for doing the RPA that we did, uh, we have not used any process mining software. Our advanced analytics team uses such software. Uh, probably that's not what we are discussing here, uh, I suppose. Okay, no problem, no problem. Um, and do you go for um, a level of benchmarking for an RPA tool selection? Um, how did you basically make that decision on um, which, which uh, RPA tool um, to buy? Sorry, not to buy, to, um, to work with. Uh, your question is about the process or the tool? My question is about the, um, the benchmarking that you did to establish which tool. Uh, yes, in our case, uh, uh, while there are more than 20 criteria that we used uh, to compare and benchmark between various players, uh, we did see the demo of how things work of uh, uh, you know most of these players. But at the end, as I mentioned, it boils down to what sort of environment that you operate in. So uh, we have some of the environment operating in Citrix. Uh, so therefore, we needed a solution that should work well in Citrix. We also have quite a many which works on Excel. So there were another tool that was more uh, uh, amenable or you know something more efficient when it comes to uh, Excel. Uh, I, I mentioned about uh, having automated well over 50 reports. Right, so it uh, you know it requires some bit of an Excel usage, Excel spreadsheet, and uh, and and the some of the system solutions or tools are very good when it comes to uh, data extraction, and therefore uh, we probably will choose that solution. So we are now uh, you know uh, will have three tools working in our environment, uh, one for uh, one for extremely rule based and, uh, uh, and and requiring the excel spreadsheet the other one to handle the citrix related uh, and the third one is mainly for uh, unstructured data where the machine learning and ocr extraction capability we have found uh, have really exceeded our expectation Okay, great. Yeah, they, um, that was actually kind of similar to another question that was asked. Um, maybe you've answered it a little bit already, but um, if you've got anything to add, um, the question says, um, in the tool selection that you showed, um, none of it, the, the, the delegate noticed that none of the um, ones look like they have cognitive capability. Um, did you evaluate tools that include cognitive um, to future-proof your journey? Yeah, no. Uh, I, I think... Um... Uh, we have we have not really ventured into the cognitive part of the RPA at this moment, mm. right? First, we need to because many of the process I believe that are all rule based, right? Doesn't require much of a machine learning, right? Except for the uh, unstructured data. So therefore, uh, as I mentioned, for an unstructured data, we needed the cognitive capability and uh, we went for a solution which had this only for the unstructured data but when it comes to the process aspects i think whatever we do are pretty much rule based and that's where we focused mm -hmm, mm -hmm. do you see yourself getting into more knowledge based or more complex activities in the future uh, i don't expect that in the next 12 months we will mm -hmm. be using uh, uh, cognitive based but I, I think there is also a bit of a cloud out there uh, we are using uh, a chatbot, right, to manage our AP help desk as well as the collection help desk, mm -hmm. right? I, I, you know, some would put that under the uh, cognitive uh, part of the automation. Uh, there are some elements, but once again, there are large parts of it is about rule based. I think there is a hype around the cognitive. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I, I believe that there is 
a lot of opportunity uh, within uh, rule based whether it is a simple or a complex and uh, there is still a difficult problem to solve when it comes to an unstructured uh, formats and unstructured inputs where we need a machine learning understand understand yeah. okay and, and the tool selection which i showed you uh, is not comprehensive i just showed you an extract of what how uh, we selected tools uh, yeah you do need to consider uh, you know from your future roadmap perspective and as i mentioned i think the next 12 months for me or 18 months is going to be lot more rule driven automation and unstructured database very good very good understand um another question that's come in um you talked about different success and different roi from the bots um have you got any idea on kind of how um a human driven environment would compare i mean what are the success ratios in a highly human driven environment maybe drawing on something before you implemented the robots i think that's uh, really the roi right so how do you compare the roi how do you really compare the benefit so it is currently performed by a human right and uh, once the bot really replaces the human and you need to uh, you know release that human effort and uh, that's really the the manpower cost that you have incurred for holding that human to perform that activity so that's the, really the uh, the savings part and you need to reduce from the savings all the cost that you incur uh to implement that bot mainly the license fee that you pay to the tool vendor and uh, you will need in infrastructure to hold that tool and the third component is the support team that i talked about uh which will have to manage that bot yeah as well as there is a business team which has to still continue to supervise that bot right so there are therefore these four costs from the the savings that you would have the manpower savings by releasing the people you need to reduce this four cost for you to get to the uh, uh, the next savings and the next saving is the benefit that you will have you need to have a payback of 12 months yeah so it's really about looking at direct and indirect costs and calculating your roi um, yeah okay yeah so but, yeah the indirect benefit is very difficult to measure right sure. so that's where i i talked about the benefits on workload balancing or a better accuracy so the argument can be that a better accuracy will also sometime lead to re uh, reduce number of people right mm. so your qualitative aspect is that how well you are able to improve your uh, experience to your stakeholders improve your experience to your employees so when the accuracy goes up that experience of the stakeholder goes up when the workload balance improves your employee experience improves so i think that's the qualitative benefit that you can hold uh, but uh, having said that the ceos uh, and cfos still want to see what is hitting their bottom line sure. right so to that extent you need to compute so there are going to be some initiative will give you the tangible benefit and some not but when you look at the portfolio level you will still be better off yeah yeah okay brilliant um sadly that's all the time we have for questions um i want to thank morty for uh, taking the time to put his presentation today today together <laughs> to deliver it today um and thank you to the audience for all the questions that you wrote in um that concludes our sessions for ai and intelligent automation live um so just to let you know um the uh, vfairs platform the ai and intelligent automation website will be available for one month so you, so you can go back in and view any of the presentations that we've witnessed over the last three days um share with your team um watch again um and any of that that good stuff you can also visit the booths um from all of our sponsors um where you can click um on their booths and receive lots of great collateral white papers templates reports lots of things that are going to help you with your RPA AI and intelligent automation journey. Um if you're not already a member, please do join the AI IA network um where we have um lots of interviews, um lots of um reports as I said, um podcasts, loads and loads of great things um and you'll be able to receive the next information about our next events. Um so we're doing an AI uh live event um for the EMEA region um in November this year um and we'll be doing an intelligent automation event for the shared service market um also in Q3 so watch out for information on those um so thank you to everyone thank you to all of the attendees thank you to all of our speakers um especially you Morty um and thank you thank you everyone goodbye <laughs>
Thank you. Bye.